The Bird Emergency. I'm Grant Williams, and here this is the podcast where we talk about birds, rare birds, threatened birds, difficult birds, elusive birds, just birds. And today, I'm really thrilled to, to meet Dan Nugent and introduce him to you. Dan's a PhD candidate working out of La Trobe University and doing a, an ecological and management project with the Plains Wanderer. How are you, Dan? Thanks for coming in. I'm good, thank you. Uh, good to be here. Thanks for inviting me along. Dan, why the Plains Wanderer? That's a good question. So before going back to uni, I, I'd been doing a bit of grassland restoration work and I'd always had a kind of interest in birds as well. Then I learned that there was a, a bird that was only found within grasslands and it combined two, two of my interests and then, yeah, just started learning about it and how unique it is and, yeah, got hooked. Now, for our listeners who are in, in Scandinavia or the uh, sitting in the cafes of Paris, what's so, what's so uh, unique and interesting about the Plains Wanderer? So it's actually really unique. So it's a small ground-dwelling bird that lives in native grasslands. It looks like a quail um, in many respects, but it's actually not related to quails at all. It's actually more closely related to uh, inland shorebirds and it actually sits with its own within its own family of birds, the Pedomidae. So it's the only member of its family, which makes it really genetically unique. So really, there's nothing else like it in Australia. Its closest uh, living relative is actually found in South America. So in genetically, it's yeah, it's one of the most unique birds in the world. And the fact that it's also critically endangered makes it a really special species. And what's your best guess at what the current population? would be of the plains wanderer it's really hard to to get a, a grasp of what it is at the moment so it's only got two population strongholds left one of them is in northern victoria the other one's in western new south wales and it, it fluctuates depending on climate and it's been really knocked about the last few years we've uh, been both of its population hotspots have been hit by drought so it's probably below a thousand we think but because it's so small and elusive it's really hard to find which makes it hard to get a really good count of it. We think, yeah, probably around a thousand-ish is probably the best estimate we have. And it's basically a, mostly a nocturnal bird, that's right, isn't it? That's what uh, most people think, but it, it's actually diurnal. The, the fact that most people think it's nocturnal is that's when you it's easiest to find. So during the day, it's so elusive. You can wander around grasslands for years and never see one. And I've only ever seen one during the day, and I've been studying it for the last five years. But at night time, you walk out into a grassland with a torch, and it would just freeze in your torchlight, and you can get up nice and close to it. And a lot of people have photographs of them at night. That's not because when they're active, that's just the easiest time to find them. They're just sleeping and, and, and dozy, and they don't run away, so they, you can get a nice photograph. So. Yeah, it's actually diurnal, probably a little bit crepuscular, most active during the, the morning and night time. But yeah, just sleeping at night. Gee, well, I think that's that would be why I assumed it was nocturnal because I think every photograph I, I, yeah. I think every photograph I've ever seen, certainly any that come to mind, have been generally it's on a, a track, uh, standing upright. Generally, a male, I think, is just about every photograph I've, I've checked out too. Now, the males do the rearing of the young. Is that right, or is that another misconception that I've got from old popular <laughs> literature? No, that's spot on. Yeah, so it's a bit of a role reversal with the plains wanderer. It's uh, the males are smaller and duller than the females, and it's uh, kind of the female who defends the territory. And then, yeah, the male does most of the egg incubation and raises the chicks, which is quite interesting. And it's actually the female who, like, vocalises, makes a big, deep, ooming sound that calls out to try and attract males. But, yeah, it's interesting in, in, in that, yeah, the roles have reversed this bird. Now, it, there's often poly, polyamorous or polygamous behaviours with birds with that sort of role reversal do the females just one clutch do they do the incubating do we know all of that we don't know it in, in a great deal of detail but we do suspect that one a female will have multiple males within her patch so she'll she'll yeah she'll lay multiple clutches of eggs for different males so yeah that that's something that's familiar with, with this species as well but yeah there's a, lo a lot of there's still a lot of mystery around with how much there's been some a bit of researching with the captive birds now that the females do play some part in the incubation process, but we think it's probably mainly the males, mainly in the wild. 
Well, let's talk about the captive, the captive population and the management in a little while. Let's just talk about the the, the bird in the wild. You, it's basically a ground dwelling bird, but it's not flight flightless. So, so do we know how much territory it covers? Does it, or, or do they pair up? Is it a home range situation? Do they defend te- territories, or are they? As the name suggests, are they nomadic? Well, yeah, it's a little bit one of the mysteries for this bird. They certainly are capable of flight and long-distance flight. There's been a bit of genetic analysis uh, done recently on a few of the populations, and there doesn't seem to be much differentiation between Victorian and New South Wales birds. So they are birds are moving between, which is, yeah, a few hundred kilometres apart. So these birds can definitely fly, and they're willing to fly. Whether they're How often they're doing those kind of movements, we're not sure. So part of my research has been tracking, putting tiny GPS trackers on these birds, and some of that's give us, given us some insight in, into how much they move. So, yeah, typically they will set up a territory and they won't fly. And we know that one of their, their best kind of strategies for avoiding predators is not to take flight like a quail might. These guys will just drop down low and either run really fast and duck in, into some grass or they'll just freeze Um they're really reluctant to fly when approached by predators, and they'll do the same thing when they're approached by people as well. Uh, living in grasslands, and it is it pre- is it exclusively grassland, or do they live in lightly wooded country as well? No, it's, it's yeah one of the one of the only Australian birds that's an exclusive grassland specialist. It won't go into pasture or crops. It needs native grassland, and yeah, it will go out of its way to avoid trees. We think that they really don't like trees because they were quite vulnerable to falcons and things that like to perch up on trees. So we, you you never really find a plains or anywhere within a few hundred meters of a tree. So they definitely need open plains country. Now, if they're avoiding pasture, does that put them in in a habitat where there's going to be a lot of domestic grazing animals? Like, it, 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 do they share their country with sheep and cattle? Is it is it sort of rangeland? I'm thinking more of the New South Wales population. Is that a rangeland popular like habitat that they're in? Yeah, well, pretty much. There's pretty much no grassland left that hasn't had, at some point in in the last two hundred years, been grazed by grazed by livestock. So these birds do coexist with livestock grazing for sure. And if they didn't, they'd be gone by now. So in both the New South Wales and the Victorian population, you will find birds on on grazing properties. So yeah, they're, they're compatible, and that, that's where you usually find them. Who owns the land now that that these remnant populations? Are hanging on in is it public managed lands or is it on a combination of public land and private land it's a combination of both yeah both there's not a great deal of grassland in the the public land estate in reserve systems a lot of plains water habitats on private land so without sustainable management by by graziers and things a bird would lose its habitat so that thankfully there there are a range of landholders who who are actively managing their, uh, their their paddocks to support the habitat that they need because they, these birds, and we've seen this the last few years in, in drought, is if you overgraze your paddocks, you'll lose the birds. They need they need the cover. They need those tussocks to hide and forage in between. And when they disappear, you, you find that the bird disappears as well. So the focus of your PhD work, Dan, what is it? Let's go through what the aims are and what you're finding out. So I guess there's two components. One of a, one of them was trying to just understand a bit more about the behaviour and ecology of the bird. So to do that, I've been using, like I mentioned before, miniature GPS trackers, attaching those to birds and just trying to understand where they're going within the grasslands, what kind of habitats are they choosing to use, what kind of habitats are they choosing to avoid, and what's the influence of things like food availability and vegetation structure in those kind of habitat choices. So there is the, the movement side of my project and habitat requirement side. And then the other side is looking at how management impacts a habitat. So I've been working with some land managers, Parks Victoria in, in in Victoria here and we've been doing some grazing and ecological burn trials to see how habitat responds to those different kind of treatments and to see which kind of which kind of management option might be best suited for the plains wanderer so they're, they're the main two research components that I've been doing 
Have you got any indications on what strategies are going to be the the most effective? So they've all, I think they've all probably got a place. So within the reserve system, they do, there's, I guess, a kind of conservation grazing where they only graze at specific times of year, which is mainly to maintain a kind of open vegetation structure for the birds and maintaining that open vegetation structure is really important. So that, that's the status quo at the moment, which is just a bit of light grazing. But I, I was also looking at something called crash grazing where you bring in a big flock of, of say, sheep and they munch all the, the grass and, and plant material down and then remove them again and give the grass then a long time to rest and to flower and to recover. So they're two different grazing techniques that I looked at and what we saw particularly the crash grazing it's quite and these are early results but it looks like it could be effective for controlling weeds within these grasslands which are impacting the plains wanderer because they're impacting the vegetation structure within the grasslands and that and that vegetation structures are really important to the bird so yeah we're getting some insight into that some other things I've been looking at with that as well is food so plains wanderers eat seeds and invertebrates and yeah so I'm still looking into the results for those things but we at this stage, we we really know nothing about what kind of impacts grazing has on on the food resources for this bird. So it's been a big knowledge gap for a long time. So just trying to start to learn something about that. Well, I'm glad you uh, mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned the invasive weeds because that that was sort of front of mind for me as a, a competitive pressure. Really, what well, what about the land based feral predators? So foxes, cats, even rats, rodent on nestlings and on eggs. Do, do we actually know much about what what's impacting the population? Yeah, the predation one's interesting. There's probably a lack of evidence at the moment about what level of impact, particularly foxes and cats. We we know they exist within the landscape, so they're out there. But there's been little limited examples of them physically predating upon birds. So. We're not too sure. We suspect that they probably are taking individuals. But, yeah, it's actually quite a big knowledge gap. We, Because it, there is no cover, I guess, there's no real shrubs or, or places for cats to hide in, we typically don't see cats out there very often, foxes you do. And so they're, they're probably having an impact. Rats you don't see out in the grasslands. We, we have uh, native marsupials, fat-tailed dunnants, which are quite common, and they seem to be doing quite well, and they also keep the mice population down. Too. so those things are that those things aren't a factor but yeah definitely need to delve into the, the impact of foxes a bit further for this species because the populations are in very limited areas and and re- a really specific habitat type how are you finding the private land holders what how, how are their attitudes to the plains wanderer and are they involved in efforts to help them hang on so i mainly work with well my research is, is focused in victoria so i only know about the victorian landholders but there's definitely a cohort of graziers up on victoria's northern plains who are going out of their way to to try and manage their grasslands for the bird and they're very proud to have the bird in their paddock and uh, a number of them have put conservation covenants on onto their grasslands, which are really good because they mean that grassland is protected from cultivation forever. And it's cultivation which is the big threat for these birds, uh, particularly in Victoria, because this is a big cereal and, and dairy and beef uh, kind of region. So we really can't afford to lose any more grassland up there. So thankfully, there are a number of grazers graziers who have a lot of grassland who are trying who are going out of the way to protect the bird and thankfully a lot of their kind of paddocks are adjacent to the national park grasslands as well so we've got a bit of connectivity and a bit of connected habitat for the birds which is really important really afford to lose any more because i think there's at, at last estimates there's something like less than one percent of the pre-european extent of grassland in that region left so yeah we're down to the the very last bits for a landholder that that does put a co- a covenant over their over their property, who administers that? What's the system? So it's a voluntary system. It's being run by uh, Trust for Nature, who, who are a non government organisation. So yeah, the, the Trust for Nature will come to you, say saying something like, "You have got really important ecological values on your property," or sometimes landholders go to them saying, "What's well, a conservation covenant? What can I get out of it?" So yeah. Trust for Nature are administering it at the moment. And so you can, there's, I think at the moment there's a, a financial incentive. I can't remember the, the number 
of, of what you get, but you do get paid to put a covenant on at the moment because, yeah, you, it's, it's good. It has, it's really important for, for grassland conservation of the bird as well. So the actual covenant, it, it is that binding for, for say, future owners or is the mm. – or, or how it works, uh, is it that there's the incentive for them to, to preserve – the land. So a future landholder, if it, if if a farmer sold, if someone had to sell, or as a result of an asset, sorry, an estate auction or something like that, the land was tra- transferred by whatever means to another person. They've got an incentive not to develop it, it or or does the covenant actually bind them to 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 no development whatsoever? Yeah, my understanding is it's binding onto the title of the land, even if it changes hands. So, so con- conservation covenants, yeah, they do restrict some practices, but they still let you. In this instance, they still allow you to run stock on, on the grassland, so you can still run it as a farm. It just means you can't cultivate. It's a cultivation, um, the soil yeah. disturbance, and I guess the just, over overgrazing would be would probably be limited, would it? So, there's probably yeah, a, yeah. Part of part of the agreement with the the covenant is that yeah. Typically, there's a stocking level for a lot of landholders up there. It, it's almost status quo management because they 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 gra- they know how to graze their the, their land sustainably. But yeah, there is certainly a restriction around, particularly during dry times, to go a bit easier on the grassland and make sure there's good grass cover even after um, a, an extended drought or something. Sounds like a positive thing all around. Apart from the, the land with covenants attached, Dan, are there any predator free? Holdings, fenced off areas that that the Plains Wanderer is is existing in. Uh, no, there's not. Yeah, so yeah, there. My understanding is that there there are there are plans to build something like that in New South Wales, but it's not developed yet. I don't think. But in Victoria, there's there's no predator free areas. If you if you drive up into the region. You'd just be driving past what you think is a paddock, but it's probably part of the national park. So yeah, there's no really just dis- nothing really distinguishing a- about it. Yeah, like I said before, even the national park, uh, they use sheep and cattle to to maintain the structure. So yeah, there's nothing too distinguishing about it. You mentioned earlier that there's a captive population. What do you what can you tell us about that? I I know that's being run by by the zoos. I think is it. That's right, Taronga and, and Melbourne Zoo. Yeah, so it's a collaborative project between a, a number of zoos uh, across Australia. So, yeah, I, I believe it's, yeah, Taronga and Dubbo and Zoos Victoria. And there's birds out of Werribee Zoo that are being bred and also Monado in South Australia, okay. yep. I believe, have birds or are getting birds. So it's, yeah, a big joint collaborative project, which is probably suitable for the bird because... It's not just found in Victoria. There's there are birds seen in New South Wales. There are birds seen in Victoria, and there's also there's also regular sightings of the bird in South Australia as as well. Up around there's a bush heritage property called Bulkamada where the birds are being seen pretty regularly over the last ten years. So the bird has a really big range, and so yeah, the zoo establishments are working across that range as well. Is there any sort of crossover between the work you're doing and the work they're doing? Are you sharing information? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I work closely with the zoo team. A lot of the information I'm getting through my tracking is going to be used to inform future release of the birds, letting us know how much space these birds need, how they can interact together. So there, yeah, there's lots of different pieces that we're, we're all feeding in between each other. How do you do the trapping for the and attaching the trackers, Dan. Yeah, so like I mentioned before, the best way to find these birds is at night time. So what we typically do is we, we get in a vehicle and we have big spotlights and things on and we just slowly drive through a paddock and eventually you will come across a bird. And what the birds typically do in a spotlight is they just freeze and you can literally go up with a fishing net and just place it over the top of the bird and, and pick it up. It's pretty remarkable <laughs> how they... Yeah, it's just a really strange thing that they this, they don't seem to notice you at night time. So yeah, it's just a case of, of putting a fishing net over the top of them. And then, yeah, so the kind of tracker I was using was a, like a backpack set up. So bands that go underneath the wings of the bird and it sits on the back. And my tracker that I was using would would it be, I'd, I'd track the birds for about seven to 10 days. So I had really small trackers. So the battery life of them was really small. So that means that they're, 
the talking to satellites over a week or so, and then I'd go back out and find the bird again using a VHF um, antenna and then recapture the bird and then get my device back. And then I have a device full of really interesting information. Just but, yeah, just having a giggle, I spoke to Chris McColl recently about his work with red goshawks and, and they can go years without finding one. <laughs> And then it's a real bugger to to catch one to fit their harness that, yeah. and they get data for about two years. But he'd, he'd probably want to strangle you about how easy it is for, for you to. You, you yeah, still got the got the difficulty of actually finding the bird before you put the transmitter on, but but you don't have to worry about a loose stitch or anything so that the bird can lose the harness. You just go and no. find them again, hit it, put another, put, put the put the it, fish net. It doesn't over always again. it doesn't always go that well. I, I've lost a few birds on a few instances. Um, I've gone back into the paddock and the bird's gone. So we think that they've it's dispersed somewhere, and because the antennas have a limited range, the VHF tra- uh, transmitters have a limited range i've been on it i've lost a few pieces of very expensive equipment so although they're easy to catch when you find them finding them again is can be really hard oh, yeah. So yeah not always easy well one of my particular inter- interests with any of those sort of projects chris dan <laughs> is, sorry for that, dan. Um, still thinking about those goshawks um, is, <laughs> is is how can how can the regular Joe, the non-academic, support your work? Is there a citizen science sort of aspect to your project? Not so much to my project. There's a really is a, uh, a volunteer group who does uh, regular monitoring of of the plains monitor population on Victoria's northern plains. They're called Friends of Terek National Park. They're a group of of, of, of locals who, who go out and a few times a year they'll go out and, and survey for the birds. They reg- so the regular counts. The, yeah, they, they do regular counts and keep an eye on how the population's tracking. So they're, they're really important part of the conservation of the species. But yeah, with my project at the moment, I've done with all the kind of fun field works things for a while. So yeah, I'm not yeah. spending too much more time in the field with that. A, a lot of times when people hear that I'm talking to a researcher, a field researcher, I think you're spending all your time out there in the glorious sun and, and uh, you know, with, with with your hat, with the corks bobbing off the rim. But how much time do you have to spend in front of a computer crunching numbers, typing reports, statistical analysis, compared to the time that you get out there and you can pretend that you're Steve Irwin? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, the the fun stuff yeah, is probably a, a smaller part of what I do than what I'd like. Yeah, maybe a quarter or something. I probably do more field work than I should anyway. But yeah, a lot of time in front of computers. And and another thing with my project was because I was interested in food for the birds. That means I've been out there collecting invertebrates and seeds, and that means I have to take those things back to the lab. And I spend a lot of time sitting in front of a microscope just counting seed by seed or insect by insect, spending a lot of time looking at screens full of numbers because, yeah, that's all we're out there to get is, is numbers. And yeah, we have to come back to, to our computers and try and make sense of them all. So, like you said, it's not, not all exciting. And re- research, uh, even though it's it's your project, it's you're the PhD candidate on this project, it sounds like you, you have to do some collaborative work with some entomologists, entomologists, not etymologists, some entomologists and maybe some botanists. Do you have a, a big team working on this? Uh, yeah, so I'm collaborating with with a few different people at the moment. Yeah, like you said, I'm getting help from an entomologist with my invertebrate samples. I've got some someone helping me with some remote sensing things, looking at habitat on quite large scales using satellite imagery. I'm also trying to understand what the birds have been eating, so I've also got a geneticist doing some kind of helping me do some uh, scat analysis. The plant stuff, I'm all right with myself. <laughs> but, yeah, my team's always growing. And another component which is coming on soon is a kind of a side project is we're also starting to look at different kind of tools for finding the birds out in the grassland. So we're starting to look at potential of using thermal imaging, so both vehicle-based thermal imaging cameras and drones and things as well. So. That's some also some people coming along to help us help me with that as well. So lots of different things going on. Be really interesting. I don't know whether you can say, but is that the the wildlife drones team? 
It's not, but this is this is just an, something that's just starting up at the moment. So we're just putting it all together, uh, as well as the as well as the thermal stuff. We're also looking into not part of my PhD, but a part of more so the the future release plans is looking into new technologies for for tracking and things. So yeah, we're keen to start collaborating with other people on that stuff as well. well that's that's pretty exciting, especially the idea that, that the breeding program w- will allow some future releases and perhaps some for the population to go in, into new areas and breed in in new areas, maybe in uh, South Australia. And well, there's got to be there's got to be suitable habitat still outside of the regular range. We would hope. Yeah, in, in Victoria, because there's been so much habitat loss, it's going to be tricky to find empty places. I think that there are a few. There are a few particularly, there's an area up near Karang, which is just south of the Murray River, where there used to be lots of birds. There's a few there now, but the population used to be much bigger there, so there's potential there. And also, particularly New South Wales, although a lot of the habitat's been lost through overgrazing in kind of the, the, the drought we've just been through, but a lot of that habitat with a bit of rain is going to be suitable again, so it, it could be a perfect place to start thinking about putting, trying to re-establish populations and things like that. You mentioned large scale habitat management. Is that is that the sort of later stages of your work? You mean in terms of grazing? Is it- oh, it, it, sort of drawing up, collaborating with the authorities, I, I guess, and the landowners on on the large scale and longer term management issues. Yeah, no, that's something I'd definitely like to to take my research. Yeah, we've got so so little native grassland left. We really need to be managing every last bit we have really well. So we've got to find new ways to do that. Conservation covenants are a part of that picture, but I think we need to be looking into other kind of incentive programs. And there are some things underway in New South Wales I know that the government is running, but we see it time and time again where paddocks are, are being overgrazed and, and we lose these really important places for the birds. So, yeah, we really need to come up with kind of better partnerships between private landholders and people working with Plains Wanderers. So, yeah, it's a space that I think we need to yeah, be paying more attention to, particularly if we're, we're looking to expand populations and things like that. Now, very much in the news lately, Dan, has been the adequacy or otherwise of the conservation laws that that are in place in Victoria, in Australia and each state has their own set as well. Now, the Plains Wanderer is critically endangered. So is there a recovery plan in place? Uh, Yeah, there is. Yeah, there was a a recovery plan produced in, I think it was 2016. Is it effective? Are there, or are there problems between the two jurisdictions with the two main populations of the bird? It's hard to say whether it's, what kind of impact it's having for the conservation of the species. One of the worrying things is we are still losing native grasslands, particularly in Victoria from cultivation. So in respect of slowing habitat loss, it's not working, which which is re- really worrying. Like I mentioned before, we can't afford to be losing more grassland than we are. And I guess one of the... One of the really tricky things with the current environmental laws is that, so say you, you have a grassland and it was ploughed up 30 years ago, grasslands are incredibly resilient and the grassland will start to come back and almost be into a state which is suitable for plants wanderers again in, in 30 years' time. But under our current environmental laws, the farm is allowed to come and, and plough up that paddock again because it was ploughed 30 years ago even though it, it might be good plains wanderer habitat now is the, the farm is perfectly within his rights to do that so in, in that in, it's just really strange one because we've got this perfect system that can recover really quickly and so we could be making really big gains in in terms of expanding the amount of grassland that's there but yeah with it within current environmental laws there, there's no really no real incentive for for, for us to be uh, allowing the grassland to come back and, and creating more habitat for the bird, which is quite sad. Well, there's no creative thought, is there? Like there, there's no thought that the habitat's got a value on its own and that the Plains Wanderer population has an intrinsic value. I guess it's pro- is it mainly sort of barley or, and wheat that is 
been cropped or is it mainly just improving pasture for grazing animals? It's a combination of all those things. And, yeah, there's a wide variety of crops that are pulled in depending on season, particularly with, yeah in, in this region. And, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, yeah the, the sad thing is that you, you can still have a working, productive and profitable farm if you have a, a native grassland. You can still graze it and produce livestock. I guess where I'm going with it is that we haven't come up with a plan where we can value untouched or maintained, suitably maintained grassland and put a value per hectare on it and subsidize the farmer so that he doesn't so that he doesn't ruin that habitat. He he can we subsidize production or lack of production in so many different ways, but when it comes to a natural population, we haven't been able to wrap our wrap our brains around that yet yeah it, it's quite frustrating and i guess <laughs> conservation covenants do that to an extent they are placing a value on that land and you are rewarded financially for securing it for conservation but because it is just a voluntary voluntary program you don't have to do it so you don't have to place that value on it and i guess yes like in a farming operation, some people don't like to be tied up with covenants as well. So there is, yeah, you do lose a bit of flexibility. So yeah, just trying to find that way where we, yeah we can put a value on it, and yeah, everyone can get a win from it. It's, it's a tricky space. Yeah, I think I think it's just we've got to win the battle that there there's actually a public good and there's a value mm-hmm. for the public in having these things remain. Once you know, and we haven't got there yet. You know we. We value old churches. We, we we value a hundred year old church at a crossroad, but we don't value you know remnant vegetation. We don't. We, we'll get there if the number of covenants is growing. That tells me that the agricultural community is slowly being converted. But perhaps what we need, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I I just think we need to think a bit outside the box that. You know, there's subsidies available for all sorts of things. So, you know, I'm not against subsidising a landowner to to maintain habitat. You know, and yeah, and, and, yeah. So there's there's, certain, there's been thoughts uh, talk about yeah those kinds of things, and also yeah having a certification program as well. I think if you're grazing your land sustainably for the species, then then maybe you should be able to put a, a certification on your product, and you get paid a higher price yeah. for that product because it, it is sustainable. So, yeah, that, yeah that, thinking along those kinds of lines for the plant wanderer might be work because it is yeah. an animal that is compatible with agriculture and food production, so we should be taking advantage of that and not, yeah. And it's iconic, as you said. Not only is it, is it you know, the, Australia's only representative of the, of the tribe, it's the world's only one. You know, it's genetically important, and but we haven't got we haven't got to that 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 stage yet. My my concern for for that sort of thinking, though, Dan, is that as soon as people realise that the koala is threatened, there'll be all these subsidies going to developers and whatnot to not develop to preserve the koala, mm. and all the money will go into a, a species like the koala, and that the unknown species, you know, like the western ground parrot and like the uh, like the plains wanderers will just be yeah. forgotten because, you know, maybe a thousand people. If you say planes wander out, you know, maybe a thousand people the ears prick up. But you say koala mm. and it's earthquakes around the world. So yeah, but really got really got off track with, with that a bit, Dan. Yeah. But uh, but yeah. I, I, it's a really good point and, and I think part of the, the trouble with the planes wander is you can't go out and see it reliably. Uh, <laughs> Even if you know where to go, it is impossible to see during the day, which makes it a hard thing to to love if if you don't get to see it. And the other thing is grasslands in themselves, they're often a, a forgotten kind of environment as well. They don't have they're not big and beautiful and pretty. You have to you have to get down in your hands and knees to impre- appreciate the diversity of, of a grassland. So it's yeah, those those are a couple of things that are up against. Yeah. Birds like the plains wanderer, I think. Yeah. But yet, God's shining his light on you, Dan. He's, he's giving you a hard time there. I know. <laughs> the sun keeps moving on me. I'm trying to. I know. I'm, I'm like, watching you, your very artful efforts to uh, to keep it out of out of your out of your eyes, Dan. And another challenge that comes up with 
with projects like like you're undertaking a PhD is money. How how is your project being funded? So luckily, I've been successful in a few grant applications, which, which is which has been fantastic. I think working on on the plains wanderer, which is one of the most conservation important species in the world, has helped. So I've been lucky enough to to be supported from um, the Victorian government. Zeus Victoria have given me money. Also, Holsworth, uh, which is a wildlife research grant provider. And I've also received some money from international conservation bodies as well to do my research. So without that, this project wouldn't have gotten off the ground. So I've been very fortunate to receive that. Like I said before, the trackers I'm using are, are, are very expensive. So, yeah, thankfully I've been, I've been able to do, to do do the research that I have with their help. Oh, that's great. So has it only been funding that you've applied for and that you've been successful getting or has there been any corporates or any other benefactors that have said, hey, Plains Wanderer, here, great, here's $20,000? Yeah, I've, I've had, to, had to plead for the, the money. So yeah, but like I said, my, my project's been a bit luckier than, than, than others. Um, like you mentioned, doing research can be expensive, particularly if you're doing field research and you have to come up with ways to fund yourself. So yeah, it's hard. But, but luckily, I think a lot of the work that particularly the zoos are doing is certainly lifting the profile of the Plains Wanderer. I think the, the number of people who, who know what is is growing slowly. So that, that's been good. And there there are some people who, who care about it. Yeah, certainly Zoos Victoria have been pretty regular in putting updates up about the the Plains Wanderer, and, and I've noticed regular bulletins about the sort of genetic work that's going on with Taronga. So hopefully I can get someone to to tell me about that. I don't expect you're going to be telling me about the genetic work that's going on yet, Dan. No, not my <laughs> area of expertise. <laughs> now, Dan, is there is there anything else that, that you think people need to be aware of about the Plains Wanderer? I don't know if we've really... Com- conveyed what a weird bird it is compared to pretty much everything else that's out there in in, in that sort of grassland air environment it's just a weird weird guy isn't it 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 is really weird and and like you said the the kind of role reversals in it between the sexes is, is quite unique the the female is, ab- is able to make this very loud deep call which can travel hundreds of meters out into a, out into the grasslands so such a, a a a big call from such a small bird is quite strange so and i get i guess there's just a lot of mystery that surrounds the bird still because you, no one has observed it behaving naturally during the day before like it's just something it hasn't been done. They're, they're so elusive that you can't do it. So there are a lot of things we, we just don't know what we do. They're doing. There's starting to be some kind of, I guess, some hot hypotheses around them doing kind of uh, part, partner partnering displays between each other. So some of the footage coming out of the captive breeding program showed that these birds would do performances for each other to, to attract mates. So it's pretty amazing. Like we, we had no idea they'd do that. The female is actually has is quite colourful and she's got a kind of a rufousy breast and a, a black and white spotty necklace and these kind of strange yellow eye and yellow beak and yellow feet. So it, it like you said, it, it's a weird bird and there, there's nothing really like it out there. So there, there, there's lots of uh, interesting things about it. So they make a call like a bustard. They, they they behave like an emu when it comes to to their breeding. They uh, they put on a performance like a bird of paradise. They look like a quail, but they won't be flushed. And you can walk up to them with a fishing net and plonk it on top of them. They're cool, fascinating little bird. And I guess it's millions of years that it's evolved to be so unique. I guess that's why it's a weird bird that there's, that's really unlike anything else. Now, Dan, I think we've talked we've talked a lot about the Plains Wanderer, but now I want to know about Dan. <laughs> it, you, we, you mentioned before we before I pushed the button that you're not sure where you are on the bird nerd spectrum. So mm-hmm. we so if we're going to find out a bit. When did you first realise that you were into birds? Were you one of those kids like me who was lying on the on the lounge room floor with a little sketch pad and badly drawing your favorite your favorite birds at the age of five yeah that pretty accurately describes me i guess it, it wasn't when i was a kid it wasn't just birds like i'd carry around field guides for everything plants and mammals and, and birds so i hadn't really 
chosen them as a kid. And I, I don't think it was really until probably university that I did a few field courses that I got into probably proper bird watching and getting quite good at identifying birds. So I was probably yeah a bit of a late bloomer to being a full bird nerd, but I got there eventually. Mate, I, I suspect that we're going to have a scary amount of things in common. If I mention a field guide and I say the name Cronin, do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. You do? Yep. And I think so. <laughs> yeah, well, because we're not talking birds at the moment, right? So the, that I, the 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 what is it the vegetation of south uh, southeast Australia you know the one Australia yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 okay and um, then if I say costumans you know what I'm talking about yeah we're talking plants again yeah yeah well I'm just I'm just Crazy. saying yeah well we've got Cronin and we've got costumans so so mm. I, I had them as a kid and as a, a student costumans was my was my like bible for years and then when it, and when i went to queensland i found that there was a similar sort of series except you needed i think i had five volumes so yeah, it was it was <laughs> hard to carry around in your backpack yeah, not as difficult of, as flora of new south wales but but costumers had everything you know throw it in your backpack and away you go yeah but we get i digress we've worked out that we're both we're both total nerds what's your field guide of choice when it comes to to birds, Dan? I guess I've gone pretty electronic in the last few years. I, I, I have the Michael Morecambe app on my phone. Yeah. My, my go-to bird one at the moment. But, yeah, I'm trying to think of what I have. I have lots of hard copies of, of all of them. But, yeah, I've gone electronic in, in recent years. Uh, so so we're, so we're going with the, the Morecambe app. In the second one recently has said that they've sort of foregone their, their hard copy field guide. So you're not a, a Simpson and Day or a Slater guy. I've definitely got copies of those field guides, but it's been a while since I've gotten out a hard copy of a, of a field guide. It yes. seems to be that the seabird and the, and the waiter people need the hard copies to to get out and to really yeah. analyse the undertail plumage and the size of the beaks and whatnot. Favourite? Favourite piece of equipment when you're out in the field, Dan? Favourite piece of equipment? Uh, Bird-related? Is that what you mean? Well, I'm, is... I'm, I'm hoping you'll lean with bird-related, but but there's some things that, that people just can't go out in the field with, without. I, 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 do you need to have a notebook and scribble notes? Is it binoculars? Is it a camera? Is it, is it a GPS locator? What is it that you have to have when you go out for a, a recreational day in the bush? I'd say it's just bin- binoculars is, yeah, obviously the one that I always carry. I write notes on my phone these days. So Actually, no, I do always have a notebook as well. Uh, I, yeah, that's all. I, I have a notebook and I have a pair of binoculars. I'm not, much in, I'm not very good at photography, so, yeah, I don't carry a, a camera too often with me. Yeah, just like to observe and, we, and take it all in well you really need an offsider if you've got if you've got a decent pair of binoculars and you've got a tripod and a camera with a you know maybe 400 or 600 lens you you need an offsider to get to do to carry some of it yeah i've seen yeah, some of the pieces of equipment that's why when i'm looking for volunteers i usually end up <laughs> With someone who's a photographer in the group, so I always have, I always get good pictures, but um, they're usually just not mine. <laughs> That's pretty good. It's pretty smart thinking, Dan. Now, what's your favourite bird? Well, I guess I won't say planes wanderer because. It, that's too obvious. If it really is. But. <laughs> I'd say either a plane's one because, yeah, I've learned to love the uniqueness of it. But So I did my honours project on the superb lyrebird in the foothill forests around Melbourne, and I think they're a pretty amazing bird as well. So they'd, they'd probably be up there too. I'm going to be talking about the, the superb lyrebird in, in an upcoming episode because um, it looks like they're knocking on the door of, of going from common to becoming endangered just from the fire season. Yeah, no, it was, they've had a huge amount of their range burnt in the fires. So some of some of my honours research looked at yeah the impacts of the the Black Saturday bushfires on lyrebirds in in that kind of fire impact zone, and they do have some abilities to persist after fire. They're quite good at quite good at finding wet gullies and places to shelter in. That's what I found. But obviously, the scale and the intensity of the summer bushfires means that a lot of gullies were burnt. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. It's, it's, a sad story coming out of a lot of those fire grounds. So, so hopefully the that if enough live birds are persisting to to um, reboost the population. 
Fingers crossed, fingers crossed. Mm. So that well, well, that's a good pair. You've got the Plains Wanderer because you know it so well and it's such a crazy duck and the superb live it. I reckon that's a good choice. Favourite place to go birding? Um, I don't get out there as, as much as I'd like to, but I, it's not just for birding, but East Gippsland, I think, is a really amazing place both for, for for plants and and animals and birds so that, that that would be one of one of them but also yeah my home patch which is in the Yarra Valley just out of Melbourne is, is also a really nice place some of the the kind of wetter forest gullies and things are a really nice place to go look for things not just live birds but all the kind of other kind of well your gully loving birds your robins your olive whistler your pilot bird yeah yes lots of those birds that make it yeah, really nice calls and it's just yeah, a really nice place to spend a bit of time and the whip bird of course yeah yes. whip birds are great on your bucket list dan your big wish for your bird watching list and where do you really want to go where's somewhere you re- anywhere anywhere in the world that you would really love to go and sit there with your binoculars it's a really good question i'm not sure i have a, an international bird that i really want to see i guess i like big raptors and things so maybe something like a philippines eagle oh, or mate, a, harpy, got... a harpy eagle or something like like that one of those massive birds of prey i think well, yeah, we, something like that it's we share that do. one we share that one i'm actually in the middle of planning my trip once everything opens up to go and see the philippines eagle and talk to some oh lucky you yeah talk to some some people who are involved in those in that project now, wow! So we've got, mm. so so we've got we've got all the same plants and and trees handbooks, and we're and we're into the Philippines eagle. That's good. <laughs> some similarities. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just it's a bit dangerous in some of the parts of uh, Mindanao and some of those those small islands where you can see the Philippines eagle. They're um yeah, they're, you're brave actually. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're, they're, I'm sure I'm brave enough to head yeah. over there anytime soon. <laughs> oh, they're oh, they're they're pretty keen on kidnapping tourists, and I've I've already hidden from the NPA in in the Philippines. It's not something I, I'm terribly eager to, <laughs> eager to repeat. <sighs> now, Dan, I I, I sometimes um, get. Uh, get a strange look and a strange response when I ask this question. But as a birder, and uh, are you are you a twitcher? Are you a ticker and a flicker, or are you just immersive when you're out there? Are you just immersed in the experience? I'd say probably the latter. Yeah, I'm. I'm not much for keeping lists or anything. But yeah, so, I, I wouldn't. So you I can't you can't tell me question. what your lifetime number is. No, I don't. I don't oh, have a number. And, yeah, I don't high have five. a list. <laughs> I don't, right. And I don't particularly go chasing too often where vagrants or anything. Yeah, well. But I just, yeah, I just, yeah, when I'm going out, out bush, I like to carry a pair of binoculars and, and see what I can find. Yeah, and do you ever record the calls? I've tried to on my phone before, but, yeah, and usually it's not as, <laughs> no, not, as no. not the same. <laughs> no, don't, don't, no, you need a, you need a pretty cool microphone to, mm. for that to, to work well. Mm. Well, Dan, you mentioned, I think I've asked you pretty much all my getting to know Dan questions. I'm glad to know that you're immersive and I'm re- I'm wrapped that you've got the, the plant field guides as well. So that's a true ecologist. I'm on my way. Yeah, still learning, but yeah, appreciate appreciate everything within the system, I guess. Now, if someone wanted to help out with, with the efforts with the Plains Wanderer, Dan, where... Where should someone reach out? And if are you always looking for volunteers to support your work? Uh, yeah, there's definitely lots of things still going on in terms of my field work and side projects that I've got going on. So, like I mentioned before, working a bit with the, the zoos on different things. So, yeah, always looking for for people who, who are willing to help, whether it's yeah, whether it's field based or, or however however you want to help. Yeah, certainly get in touch we want some business from the in the northern plains area or you know the central victoria bendigo or northwards we want some business to really to take hold of of an association with the iconic plains wanderer 
and and come up with a sizable a sizable donation, don't we, Dan? That's that would be the best thing. We we need to start securing a bit more habitat. I think if the plants want to have a viable population, yeah, like I mentioned before, we can't afford to to lose any more. So whether it means acquiring more property or just supporting landholders to to do the right thing, I think yeah, it's the best way we're going to save the bird. If somebody is sitting at home and going, what can I do? What can I do? Is there somewhere they should write to to apply pressure for acquiring land or more stringent controls on land use? Or is it really a matter of supporting the projects that are underway, maybe through the various zoos? And zoos and trusts for nature yeah, uh, yeah probably the leaders in, in plains wanderer conservation at the moment but yeah like well, like we spoke about before the, the nature laws are really failing the plains wanderer they're, they're they're not protecting the habitat and as a lot of people are probably aware the nature laws are under a review at the moment the, the federal environmental laws that protect species so yeah obviously writing to to ministers and things like that it, it won't hurt to know that people care and people want to see stronger nature laws for the species. Sadly, I think the government tipped its hand about this review by putting one of Australia's you know, most influential businessmen in charge of the review. <laughs> I don't think uh, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not uh, holding my breath for yeah, a good outcome. Yeah, I don't think that was a real positive sign. Yeah, but fingers, no, but fingers yeah, I think crossed. that's why. Yeah, the some of the on ground stuff. Yeah, Trust for Nature and Zoos Vic, they're, they're doing really good things, and and so there's a bunch of community groups in New South Wales are also doing positive things. So, yeah, definitely reach out to those people. I'll put some links for uh, Trust for Nature, Zoos Victoria. Taronga Zoo, you mentioned the other ones, and, and Friends of Terek National Park, we'll, we'll give them a, a shout out as sure. well. And yeah, yeah, if people want to come up and see the grasslands, yeah, there's lots of different ways you can do that. And if someone wants to follow you a bit more closely, Dan, I'm guessing that Twitter's the place to, to go for Dan. Yeah, Twitter's, Twitter's the one. Yeah, don't, don't have a web page or anything, but yeah, Twitter, I'll regularly let people know what I'm up to. And I'll link in the show notes, Dan, but it's at Dan Nug. Yep. Yeah, at, at D Nug. Yep. Oh, yeah, D Nug, not Dan name. Nug. D Nug. Yeah, shortened it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. Um, I, re- I reckon people will, will want to look up the Plains Wanderer after our little chat. I'm not too sure anyone's going to, going to be out spotlighting in the grasslands we don't want to encourage that not at all but yeah do exercise your curiosity and and find out more about the plains wanderer and especially if you want to follow up on 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 the really good work that's being done before dan publishes all of his results which will be hopefully something within the next year would be nice but not everything that's for sure yeah but yeah zoos victoria and taronga zoo really active with the Plains Wanderer, and and they're pretty easy to to find. Dan, thanks for being a participant in the bird emergency. And no, thanks for having me. This has been good to chat. And best wishes with your academic endeavours and your practical endeavours to to preserve maybe Australia's weirdest bird. And it's probably up there. <laughs> Very unique. All right. All right, Dan, thanks so much. Thebirdemergency.com is where you can find the links on the web page. And look at that feedback stage where I'm looking for some feedback. So if you can check out Bird Emergency on at Twitter and tell me if you like the show or if you don't like the show or if you want me to shut up or, or perhaps head out to your podcaster and uh, podcatcher and leave us a review. That would be great. All right. Cheers. Catch you later. Uh-oh.